morning. On behalf of the congregation of the First Presbyterian Church, I want to welcome you to worship with us this morning. Uh, I invite you to sign the Welcome to Worship slide, your bulletin inserts. Please take note of the announcements that are printed in your bulletin inserts. I want to make special mention of Uh, the Presbyterian women are still supporting the Crawford County Coalition Housing for Emergency Shelter. Uh, no teaching is required. Uh, details about that are printed as well. There will be a new members class here next Saturday, uh, or I'm sorry, Saturday, uh, May 14th at 10 o'clock a.m. Uh, that will be in the chapel. Uh, note also the Allegheny College Choirs present their spring concert on Saturday, April 30th. That's 315 at Schaefer Auditorium. Uh, note also the 2022 Easter flower donations. Please keep those individuals in your hearts, in your minds, and in your prayers. And finally, uh, on Easter Sunday, we received the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. It's the biggest offering uh, of the year for the Presbyterian Church as a whole. Uh, it supports Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and the self-development of people. Please give that your prayerful consideration. I believe that concludes my portion of the announcements for this morning. Let's now prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Good morning. On this Easter Sunday, please join me in the call to worship. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Glory to you, O oh God. On this day, you won victory over death raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Glory to you, O Christ. For us and for our salvation, you overcame death and opened the gate to everlasting life. Glory to you, O Holy Spirit. You lead us into the truth. Glory to you, O blessed Trinity, now and forever. Amen.
On this Easter, we come with confidence before God's throne of grace. We know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, yet we are justified by the gift of God's grace through the redemption that is ours in Christ Jesus. Trusting in God's grace, mercy, and love, let us confess our sins. Please pray with me the prayer of confession. Let us pray. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death forever. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. Forgive us, God of grace. Help us to trust in your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant in Christ Jesus, the risen Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. It is a fact that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In silence, let us then offer our personal and private confession to God. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. By his resurrection from the dead, new life is given. Friends, believe the good news of the Gospels. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Living God, today's good news is so wondrous that we struggle to wrap our heads around it. Give our hearts the wisdom to receive that which our heads cannot fully understand. Send your spirit to fill our whole bodies with your resurrection promise. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson for today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. This is a section entitled, The Glorious New Creation. Please follow along in your pew Bibles on page 851. Hear the word of the Lord. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it, or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. 
They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. like to invite the young disciples to come up front. morning. I have a story to share with you this morning, and it is called The Mystery of Easter. There once was a man who loved big enough to change the world. People knew he was in God and God was in him. Everywhere he went, people would ask him, what's the best way to live? This man whose name was Jesus, answered, Love. Love God, love yourself, love everyone else. Now, there were some people who didn't like what Jesus was teaching. They did not want to be told to love God, love themselves, and love everyone else. It is a very hard thing to love that hard. Instead of learning this hard thing, they decided that Jesus needed to be killed. The hard part of this story is that Jesus' enemies did not want to learn to love, so they had Jesus killed on a cross. The cross reminds us of a sad thing. Jesus' friends, the ones who knew that he was in God and God was in him, were very sad. They remembered how it felt when Jesus was around, like God was in them too. Jesus' friends put him in a tomb, which was like a cave, and they used a big stone for the door. Then they took some time to cry and hug and try to mend their broken hearts. Later, several of Jesus' friends went to the tomb where he was buried. Sometimes when you're very sad when someone has died, it helps to go visit their grave. The tomb was like a grave, and Jesus' friends were very sad. When they got there, they discovered that the huge, huge stone that had been blocking the entrance had been moved out of the way. Inside, they saw a man dressed in white robes who said to them, Do not be afraid. You're sad, but here is good news. Jesus is alive again. This is the story that changes the cross. It still reminds us of a sad thing, but now it also reminds us of a good, important thing. Now it reminds us that no matter what, no matter what happens or how hard things are, we are with God and God is with us. This is the secret to loving God, loving yourself, and loving everyone else, that God is always with you. Now, after we say our prayer together, I have a little cross for each of you that was made out of the palms that we waved last Sunday, okay, to remind you that God is always with you. Can you bow your heads and say a prayer with me? Dear God, thank you for the cross. Help us remember that you are always with us. 
Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Listen for the word of God. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the door of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone was rolled back. It was very large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were amazed. He said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. May the Lord bless to our understanding these readings from his holy word. Let us pray. O Lord our God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Once upon a time, a husband and a wife took a trip overseas to visit the Holy Land. It seemed, however, as though the poor woman could do absolutely nothing right. Her husband complained about the lengthy flight, as if that was somehow her fault. Her husband complained about the bumpy bus rides as if that was also her fault. Her husband complained about the local food as if that was her fault as well. It seemed as though he complained about everything. 
as if it was somehow her fault. While they were there, however, the man inexplicably passed away. The local undertaker told the man's wife that he could ship the body back to the United States for burial at a cost of $25,000, or she could have the body buried in the Holy Land at a cost of only $1,500. The woman thought about that for a minute, then replied, I think I'd really rather have him shipped back to the United States. The undertaker was surprised. He said, why would you spend $25,000 to have your husband shipped back home when you could have him buried here in the Holy Land for only $1,500? The woman replied, another man died here 2,000 years ago, and three days later he came back from the dead. <laughs> I just can't take that chance. <laughs> Now there's a person who believes in the resurrection. Perhaps the question now is, do we? Dr. Charles Taylor was a professor at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec. He notes that although we may now live in a somewhat secular age, we should not think that religious belief is completely waning. What is the case, however, is that the option of whether or not to believe is now much more socially acceptable. So apparently is the option regarding what to believe. Thus, in the 2,000 years since that first Easter Sunday, when faith in the resurrection was what distinguished the Christian faith from everything else, things have changed dramatically. We have seen the rise of non-Christian religions in places that used to be dominated solely by Christianity and Judaism. We have seen the rise of numerous variations on the Christian belief itself in which Christianity is hardly even recognizable anymore. We have also seen the rise of philosophy that any approach to God will do as long as it works for me. In many cases, the resurrection has either disappeared from belief altogether or it is doled out to everyone like candy at a parade. Woody Allen once professed that he did believe in a higher intelligence that existed throughout the universe, except in certain parts of New Jersey. For some, the acceptance of a higher power is all they believe. In other cases, belief in the resurrection, while still held, has been so trivialized that it seems to play absolutely no role in defining the faith at all. Garrison Keeler tells the story of how a new young priest at Our Lady of Perpetual Responsibility Catholic Church in Lake Wobegon decided that the faith needed a little sprucing up. Thus, one Easter Sunday morning, worshipers were greeted with a large poster of a water skier on the altar with words written in large letters underneath, he's up. For some, that is the depth of their belief. In the ancient church, however, the Christian faith was really quite specific and was also really quite uncompromising. It was faith in the resurrection that defined a Christianity and distinguished Christianity from everything else. The New Testament writers were all quite clear about that. But what does it mean when we say that the essence of the Christian faith is faith in the resurrection? Perhaps one way of getting at the, what the church initially meant is to first say something about what the church did not mean. It did not Nor was the resurrection anything like chicks hatching from eggs or the rebirth of dormant plants in the spring. Nor was the resurrection something that was merely contrived to spare the embarrassment of Jesus' devastated followers after his tragic death on that first Good Friday.
had changed. They believed the world was different that first Easter Sunday than it had been just a week before when Jesus paraded into Jerusalem amid pomp and circumstance. They believed the world was different that first Easter Sunday than it had been the Friday morning before when Jesus was crucified. How was it different? Well, for starters, sin and death had been conquered by the death of Jesus Christ, and Christ was now alive. What's more, he was now the one who was running the show. That's how the world had changed. It was different than it was last week, and because it was different, those who had faith in the resurrection understood that they could now live differently than they had the week before. How? To get a contemporary sense of how things have changed, consider a phrase that some of us have been hearing for more than Many things have changed since 9-11. In the immediate aftermath, there were soldiers patrolling our airports with rifles. Things changed for some of those soldiers themselves as well. Many of those soldiers were very young men and women who probably <clears throat> signed up for the National Guard not long before, probably just hoping to get their college paid for in exchange for going to something akin to summer camp. Then suddenly they were patrolling airports with rifles. It wouldn't be long before many of them would find themselves doing tours of duty in some far off desert. Things had changed, too, in that we discovered we had a whole new set of enemies. As a result, security everywhere was tightened, and what we once did freely, we suddenly had to do under watchful eyes and careful supervision. Try getting through an airport sometime. We don't particularly resent it, I don't suppose, given the alternative, yet this increased security has certainly had its effects. Everything takes a lot more time now, does it not? Yet the fact of the matter is, we have not changed that much at all. All that may have really changed is that the warning level has gone up. Because the fact of the matter is, even before 9-11, violence was a serious concern for many of us. The worry just wasn't as present in our minds before then as it is now. Violence had just become more obvious, and we had to realize that it was nearer than we suspected. Still, violence has always been a part of our lives, and that has not changed. Dr. Stanley Hauerwas was a professor at the Duke Divinity School. When he was told for the umpteenth time that everything's changed since 9-11, he said, gosh, I thought everything changed 2,000 years ago. He was speaking, of course, of Jesus Christ. In other words, the fears upon which we base our lives and upon which we have always based our We need not live in fear of anything anymore. Jesus Christ was once described by a contemporary theologian as one who was Perhaps we are not quite where he was as of yet. I mean, we are, for the most part, pretty good people, and we generally know the difference between good and evil. We are especially good to those who are good to us, and we also know that if somebody, some stranger, or even some mere acquaintance hurts, he deserves our sympathy. We know that if someone is lonely or afraid, she needs a friend. But rarely are we bold enough to be that friend or to give that sympathy if we perceive that it threatens us in some way. If offering our compassion threatens our social standing, our careers, our time, our treasure, or our reputations, we tend to shy away in fear. What? If someone clearly needs a friend, who's considered or to lose social standing, or even to catch cooties. Fragile self-images are easily threatened, and so the young tend to be socially conservative and take very few risks. Yet are adults really any different? 
We worry because we think we run the risk of losing our place in the line of advancing to the goal of life, as it were. Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus was not afraid for his reputation, for his social standing, for his career, and as a result, Jesus was not afraid to do what needed to be done. Oftentimes, the dividing line between and what we do is simply fear. In Jesus' case, he didn't mind the risk. In fact, the only risk he seemed to really worry about was the risk of not doing the good that he did free from the inside out. We tend to be afraid of what is outside of us such that we lose our inner selves. Yet Jesus was fearless, even to the point of death on a cross, to die for a people who are sometimes pretty risky propositions. Perhaps the real point of Easter is to vindicate, on God's part, the choice of that kind of life. Now, I hasten to point out that by itself, the vindication of Jesus' way of life on that first Easter Sunday doesn't necessarily change the eternal deficit between the merely human. again at Pentecost, the freeing and unleashing of a spiritual power among men and women that gives them the same power that was in Christ Jesus. That power gives us life if we are willing to risk sharing in his generous death for the good of others. And in giving us his life, it gives us the power to risk everything. Therein lies the possibility of the ultimate good for which we all hope. That then is how things have changed. That is what the ancient church believed, and that is how the ancient church was actually empowered. That is how the ancient church was able to, as it says in the book of Acts, turn the world upside down. The church was no longer afraid to take a risk in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know that we really have to turn the world upside down. I don't know that we even know any longer what it would actually mean to do so. Yet we do talk a lot these days about change. And it's also difficult to know exactly what that means anymore. What I do know this morning, however, is that as Christians, we need no longer be afraid. We can now be unafraid to go out and do the good in the world that really needs to be done. Why can we do these things now? Because on this day, we have been given, through Christ's death and resurrection, the power to be changed. The power to be changed into people who are not afraid of doing good for others and not just doing good for ourselves. Perhaps the chief point of the resurrection is to give us light. Light to see who we are and who we can actually become. Light to see the good that needs to be done and the freedom to do it. And light to show us the way and the truth and the life. The resurrection gives us light to see the supreme value of humility and self-sacrifice and light to see the poverty of self-interest, self-absorption, and self-importance. Believe then in the resurrection. Proclaim it with your very lives and use its light to no longer be afraid of what people might say. Use it to do the good that needs to be done. Use it to love God and neighbor. Use it to do the same humble, self-sacrificing good that led Jesus Christ from the cross to the resurrection. Then, perhaps without even knowing it, we will have changed ourselves. And then, perhaps the thing that most needs to be changed, will have changed. Amen. Can we now please rise and join with me in saying we believe by way of the Apostles' Creed, which is printed in your bulletins. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
let us unite our hearts in prayer. Eternal God, we praise you that your glory has dawned upon us and brought us into this day of resurrection. We rejoice that the grave could not hold your son and that he has conquered death, risen to rule over all powers of this earth. To you, O Lord, we offer our allegiance, adoration, praise, and celebration for the victory over the grave and the promise and gift of eternal life through Jesus' resurrection power. Keep us firm and steadfast by the presence and guidance of your Holy Spirit, that we may be dedicated followers of the one who is the resurrection and the life, and who is the way, the truth, and the life. We rejoice, dear God, that in this season, as families and friends gather, that joy, happiness, reunion, renewal, and reconciliation may occur. As the one who loves us to the utmost, may we share your love with those around us. We praise you that Jesus summons us into new life to follow him with joy and gladness. As we celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ, we affirm the mission endeavors we help to support. That of Ross and Mary Hunter in Ecuador, Reverend Celestine Muzakura in East Africa, Donnie Brake in South Sudan, Myung Ho Yang and Ji Yun Yo at Payap University, Thailand, Josh Heikala in West Africa, Andrew and Amy Funka at Alongside Ministries, Compassion International, especially the two students we help to support, Carlos and Mamini in Haiti, the Lagunov Hospital in Haiti, We Kirk Conference, Presbyterian Disaster Relief, Living Waters for the World, and the Carter Foundation. We thank you too for the mission endeavors within our communities and pray for blessing upon them as they seek to serve, to bring help, and to bring hope. Lord, we lift these joys to you. Thanks be to God. Lord God, redeemer, good shepherd and savior to all who would accept your loving and saving embrace, we turn to you grateful for honoring our dear ones, those living among us and those who have passed to eternity. In the remembering, we thank you for the blessings of life, for the privilege of special moments, and for the depth of relationship. By the flowers today, we honor and remember those dear to us. Thank you, Lord, for each of these persons May their influence in our lives lead us to be better people, dedicated citizens, and faithful followers of your Son, Jesus Christ. In remembering, dear Lord, you bring emotion to our hearts, minds, and souls for our loved ones. Help us to honor those about us. Help us to cherish those who have entered eternity. Grant gratitude for life lessons and wisdom imparted to us. We intercede this day for those for whom Easter is a difficult time because of loneliness, anger, depression, grief, or despair. May your presence break through and give some life-sustaining and life-supporting affirmation, for you stand with us always. We pray. experience since his death on April 8. Be with Claudia, his wife. We pray for those who are ill, recuperating, experiencing chronic illness, loss of mobility, or other ailments. Especially be with John Robb, Elijah Boyd, Kathy McKinney, Janet Kohler, Becky Jordan, Tom Hilburn, Margie Thompson, Sherry and Tom McFate, Jeremy Priskowski, Carol Young, Ginny Birchfield, and others. Watch over them and grant your presence and strength. We intercede for those who render service for our country. 
be with service personnel, Ben Barto, Donald Alba, Andrew Paul. Bring safety and security to our country. By your providence and grace, we thank you for participation in relieving the hurt, hunger, and need of the world through the one great hour of sharing offering, through the outreach of the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, Hunger Program, and Self-Development of People. We seek to assist and uplift the people of Ukraine as they endure war and its tragedy. Grant them strength for the challenges of each day. Lord, we lift these concerns to you. Lord, hear our prayer. O God of grace, you cause the sun to rise and chase away the shadows of death. Each day you promise resurrection that we may be born anew to new life and to overcome all that would hurt and destroy. Fill us with the Holy Spirit that we may be alive again with the power and the peace of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, in whose name we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
many of you know our youngest son was a captain in the Marine Corps and as such was a sleek, agile fighting machine. He recently left the Marine Corps. He wants to fly the C-130s out of Youngstown for the Air Force. Meeting with an Air Force colonel, he said, Sir, I don't know how to be an officer in the Air Force. The Air Force colonel simply said, it's easy. Just put on about 40 pounds and you'll be just fine. <laughs> Sorry to any Air Force people. It'll, the colonel alleviated his fears, and that's what the Apostle Paul was doing when he wrote, in life and in death, we belong to God. Because of the resurrection, we have nothing to fear either. Now go in peace. Know that God our Father abides with us always. And I'm in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the of the Holy Spirit.